All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to the 43rd episode of The Get Down. My name is Kareem. Gary W. here. We are back to having a guest, and this week we have Parari. What's up, Parari? Yo, yo, pew, 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 doing the sound of what we just talked about. We need some sound effects going on in here. Gary, we got to get the soundboard. Every single week we talk about it. It just hasn't been done. You know, so just blame it on the finance department. I apologize. Yeah, well, gigs are coming back, so funds will be there. So Parari is yet another local New Jersey DJ who is a big artist and has records on all kinds of labels and is playing big shows. And it it really speaks to the talent that we have in New Jersey. And we really wanted to bring you on to talk about a bunch of stuff, but we, we work in the same market. So we're kind of going through a lot of the same things and, and kind of leaning on each other to be like, Hey, well, what is this venue doing? And, and what should we do with the price at this venue? So what, what's your experience been with, with your getting back to work? Yeah, I mean, well, it was definitely a challenge. I mean, we've talked about this a couple of times. I know, you know, once like, I guess the state started to open up, I know we were chatting back and forth on how should we approach the bars? What should we do? But I mean, I really got to say COVID obviously messed up a lot of things. Um, There's been a lot of other issues as far as undercutting and stuff like that. But as far as the bars opening, I think by now we're all pretty much back to work. And I think the biggest challenge was how do we go back to work and get back to what we were? Because we're not playing full rooms. We're playing rooms with people sitting down. Um, You know, obviously the income for the bars is not there anymore. That may affect our rates. That may not. But I think we're back to a point now where everybody can get the rates everybody can go back to a normal the only thing that we have to adjust to is like the sitting down i don't know how you guys have been dealing with that for me it's it's like a it's such a weird situation because i have energy i get people standing up and then everybody tells everybody to sit down so for me i'm trying to find a balance now of just playing me but also kind of like keeping the crowd under control a little bit because i also don't want my bar to shut down because you know x y and z people keep getting out of hand and the cops walk by and shut the thing down you know that's not what we want to do we want to play it safe still do our job but it's hard when we're in a room when we're trying to play energy but you know uh i'm happy to be back i'm happy to be working again i'd much rather be leaving my door going to make my money than sitting home and collecting this unemployment thing that's definitely a better situation It's kind of funny because I just came back, what, two weeks ago now, and my I had my first experience with the DJ having to shut the music off and tell people to sit. (laughs) And at that point, I'm like, I I kind of don't want to be here anymore. Like, I this is not an environment that I feel like partying in. Because like, and and then I like looked over at the DJs and I'm like, I feel horrible for you guys. Like, it's like two a.m. It's like. That, that like 40 minutes till closing time all the time when you're trying to do crowd control, everybody's too drunk. So you don't want to play anything too ratchet yeah. and you don't want to bounce the pissers off the uh, piss the bouncers off. And you're trying to like, you're, you're kind of walking on eggshells about what you're playing, you know, just to make sure people don't get too aggressive. So right. on and so forth. I feel like it's like that all night. Like that's not a good way to be playing. Um, uh, I hate to break it to you, Gary, but I'm, I'm that guy that shuts the music off and tells everybody to shut up. Cause I ain't gonna lie. I mean, <laughs> What, what no, are my I understand, venues? I understand why you have to do it. I get it. So, I, I mean, it, you have to. I, I, one of my venues, you know, I think I'm playing slow. I'm playing 105 BPM, just like, you know, really nice tempo, thinking like I'm going slow. And, you know, the young kids, they want to party. They've been locked in their house for a year. They're going to go crazy. And, of course, it got crazy. So I get a text from uh, the bouncer. And he texts me and he goes, Will you please, please, please stop being a good DJ for five minutes so these people could calm down? And I'm like, dude, I think I'm playing slow. So I'm like, okay, yeah. So he comes down. He's like, you got to make an announcement. And unfortunately, that's our job. We have to make announcements. It's not the type of announcement that we want to make. We're used to last call, put your hands up, this. But we got to make this announcement. So I shut the music off because it was getting really bad. And I said, you MFers, please, if you want this thing to go on, dance at your table don't blame me blame governor murphy don't have anything to do with me just please if you want this to go on you want to have fun do that so everybody screams okay we'll listen put the music back down or back on everybody listens everybody listens and the bouncer comes downstairs and goes dude they listen to you better than they listen to me and like 
I feel like that was kind of cool in a way because I have complete crowd control, yeah, crowd not only over the music, but now they're listening to me and I'm their babysitter, which I don't want to be. <laughs> but, you know, I think we resolved it now where we got a bouncer that, you know, goes around the tables and, and just kind of keeps everybody sitting down. So I don't know how it's been working at your guys' venues, but that's what's going on for me. At one least. of one of the places that I'm at, they do like multiple seatings throughout the day. So my set will be like four to 10, let's say. And there's two seatings within that four to 10 where like we turn the lights on and I like shut the music off and kick people out at 7 p.m. Like it's end of night. It's it's like, it's like blows that's my mind every time me. I do it. Yeah, that's crazy. But hey, but, we got to do it until it gets back. So the, the other thing with that is like, I'm dropping bombs and there's like four or five bouncers. So like you guys do your job. I'm going to do my job and like rock the room. And that's how I kind of look at it. But there are other venues that only have like one bouncer and they have to deal with checking IDs and making sure people are sitting. And like, I get that. So, yeah. And that was us. And to be honest, the reason why a lot of it, we only had one bouncer is a lot of people don't want to come back to work because, you know, whether they're afraid of COVID or financially, it's not, it's going to ruin their unemployment or whatever. And I understand that I was in that position too, but it's going to be hard, you know, to get back to work. And for me, I was on unemployment, just like everybody else, still making money side hustles here and there. And we'll talk about that later, I'm sure. But when it was time to come back to work and the unemployment was, from my understanding, ending March 13th, I was kind of already ahead of the game saying like, OK, gigs are coming back. Let me get back into my venues and, you know, get back to work making just as much money as unemployment, if not more, before the next guy comes in, takes all my gigs takes all my stuff, and then I'm left in the dark. And I think now if you're a DJ and you're not back to work right now, it's going to be very hard for you to get back to work and get a consistent DJ schedule. Because I know you and I have talked about, there have been guys that since June that have been playing Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I'm lucky right now to even be playing a Friday and a Saturday, like yeah. consistently. And then there's other guys who are playing maybe three times a month, four times a month, and they want that work. But if you didn't get in on that little gateway where unemployment was ending, get back in, like, I don't think it's going to be easy to get back to work because there's a lot of DJs, not enough gigs right now. And I think we're starting to see a pattern where a lot of guys are maybe either starting DJ groups like Get Down or they're holding venues, like they're taking their venues and they're starting to bring it and seeing how important accounts are and holding accounts. This way they can book themselves, book their friends and help everybody out. So we're going to start seeing a lot of that until this opens up, or at least that's what I'm seeing. It's incredible how many residencies are going to come out of this. Yes. Or have, have come out of this, you yep. know, and how many like guys are riding, riding, dying by individual venues. Yeah. Um, and vice versa. And managers are doing the same with, with, with DJs. Something that you didn't, you, you know what, pre that we saw it creeping back where like you saw residencies coming back where you'd see a guy in the same place every Friday night, where in years past, like that wasn't that, that wasn't a thing really anymore. You were seeing just guys cycled through venues more or less, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm, and we're hearing from managers cream, right? More and more that like managers want to see the same DJs back and, and create this familiarity with them. Uh, right. Within because the they have so much other stuff that they're worrying about that they don't want to worry about the music. They want to know who their DJ is. They want to feel safe and comfortable and, and, and know that they like the music and not have a wild card of, well, I've never seen this DJ before. I don't know what they're going to play. Can they keep my room? Can they, you know, do the job that this other DJ that I really like can do? Right. So, and, and I'm even trying to open up opportunities for some other guys that, you know, want to get into clubs because I can't find DJs that want to work. So I'm in a situation now where guys have either in the last year started another job or another side hustle that is like, I guess, making more money than DJing. So they don't want to come back to work. The B, they don't want to ruin their unemployment. So they don't want to come back to work. And at the same time, I need to book DJs and I need to have fill in spots because I can't be Superman and DJ five venues a night as much as I'd love to do that. I can't do that. So when I book a new guy, you know, now it's like, okay, are you going to be able to hold the room? Granted, it's people sitting down. So it can't be that hard. As long as you're playing some popular music, you should be okay. And that's why I feel comfortable starting new guys, but I'm trying to open the door for other DJs and some of them won't even take the, the opportunity. You know what I'm saying? And that's crazy to me too, because I'm sitting here like, Hey, I'm going to pay you. And I'm giving you an opportunity and giving you a home in Hoboken where, you know, you will be taken care of. You're doing me a favor by playing. So when this comes back to normal, I could guarantee you a spot on our roster because X, Y, and Z DJ doesn't want to work. And, you know, and, and, and some of the guys still even deny that. And to me, that's crazy, but 
again, we're in such a weird time. Who would have ever predicted this? Not me, not you, but all we could keep doing is just moving forward. And I think by, I keep saying 4th of July, uh, I've been saying that since like March, we should be a okay. I, I feel like so. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, something that, that another thing that we talk about off air that I think um, Gary and I really saw a lot when we were down in Charleston, we saw a lot when we were down in St. Pete and Tampa, that the venues that do well there are the venues where hospitality is A1. Yeah. And I feel like in our market, in the Hoboken, Jersey City area, there are only a handful of places that really, really, really like put out a high quality hospitality product and really take care of their people. And I think that's like a huge gap in our market that if we wanted to start a venue, we could crush it if we had really good <laughs> hospitality. But yeah. What, what are your thoughts on, on the hospitality in our market? I mean, I got to say, I, I feel like hospitality goes hand in hand with relationships. If you're just if you're a good, good person, you're not a dick, you do your thing, you do your job right, hospitality comes and I feel like people treat you the right way. Um, but then again, going back to the venue standpoint, yeah, I mean, all of my venues, I have to say, you know, treat me with the utmost hospitality. The minute I walk in the door, the bartender's like, what are you drinking? Who are you with? What are they drinking? Um, and I think that plays a big part of why my friends who not only come to see me, but just come to the venue, come back all the time because yeah, they treat you right. You treat them right. You give them a good tip. You're going to get treated the right way every single time you walk in. They don't have to wait on the line. They know that these people are coming here every week. They're going to spend X amount of dollars. They're going to take them before a table of four comes in, buys one drink, and then leaves for whatever reason. I think another trend that you guys are starting to see now, too, is a lot of the celebrity bartenders who do treat people right, whether it's whatever venue. So let's say it's uh, – venue a and this bartender's there and people go to see that bartender they're actually now being like i guess like subletted out i don't know how that works but they're play they're, they're go hopping around venues and they're kind of being like celebrity bartenders by going to this venue going to that venue almost as an important job as us like if we have to bring in people the bartender is going to bring in people as well and i think that's cool that people follow those bartenders around now which is awesome like i see a party that's happening this summer where you know dq and like these guys are all bartenders and I'm like, that's dope. Like, that's fucking cool that you're taking the people that are just in, as involved with the hospitality stuff and you're bringing them other places. You know, I think that's a dope thing that's happening right now. You hit on something that um, is really underlooked is staff taking care of the DJ's friends, because like this is an easy way where like, listen, you have that DJ back every week that if you take care of those friends, those friends will be back every week. The minute yeah. you don't take care of them, like. Yeah, my friends have seen me DJ probably a thousand times, quite yeah. literally. Like, <laughs> they don't want to come see me DJ again. But if you give them good drinks and good hospitality, they're coming back every time. I can, you know? I can tell you that, like, the minute all of my close buddies finally moved to Hoboken the same time I did, um, they were at Mills every week, whether I DJed or I didn't DJ. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they were there and it wasn't just them. They were going to see the bartenders. This bartender would hook them up. This bartender would make them grails. It's not even on a thing that you could, you know, order at like, you know, Mills, but like they would make the drinks for DJs, like the grails and people would chug them. And like that, that's the type of stuff that like my friends appreciate and always still go back. Now it's been five years since I've been there. My friends are constantly always coming back, even pandemic wise, you know, now my friends are just coming with eight people, nine people sitting at a table or whatever. And now instead of spending, you know, $50 a person here, they're running up a tab for $500, but they don't care because they're getting taken care of. Some of those right. drinks are comped. They run up a $500 tab. They're going to bring out around the green tea shots for everybody because they know them. And I think that's what keeps people coming back is that good hospitality. See, that's that's something that happened to us in South Carolina. Him and I, Cream and I weren't even DJing there. And the owners were coming up to us being like, you guys need drinks. You guys want drinks? Same thing in St. Pete uh, at one of the venues that Cream was DJing at. The manager not only went up to obviously Cream, but up to me and my girlfriend were like, you guys need anything? You guys get to go. And we were introduced to the owners and everything. And, and it's just something that doesn't happen too, too often in our market. Right. Where like somebody where like the owner is going to go out of his way 
to to introduce himself to like the DJ's friends and the DJ's like crew. You know what I right. mean? Right. And and half the time the owner isn't even there. You know, I, I well, know plenty of venues where the owner doesn't even show up, which is fine. I mean, I get it. You're running a business. You don't want to be there on the weekends. That's cool. I get it. Like right. you don't want to be there at two in the morning. But you know, I think that like you said, that's such a big thing. The DJ's friends and just taking care. I, I feel good when I walk into a place and somebody always takes care of me. Like yeah, whether every, the place is packed does. or what exactly anybody, uh, whether it's food, drinks, like right now it's actually been food because if you think about our gigs, we start at eight o'clock and with my busy schedule, I go right from a studio lesson to like showering to DJing. I don't have time to eat. I mean, Aunt, you've been over, you know, where I'm eating like while you guys yeah. are here because I don't have time. I physically don't have time today. The gigs are earlier. So now what they're doing is they're comping food for me, which is great. And, you know, I really, you know, I appreciate that. And I'm sure they appreciate just as much as work they do for us. And hospitality wise, we do for them too, as far as bringing people in and, and you know, tr- bringing people with respect, I think is a big thing too. You don't want to be that guy who brings five of your boys and they're breaking glasses and throwing shot glasses across or, you know, touching people. Like you don't want to be that guy. You bring in the friends that like, you know, take care and are respectful of, right. of the other people working right, and there know as well. how to tip and do correct. All. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've had my fair share of friends that, you know, will go get a drink for me. I'll, they'll say, Hey, can I get you a drink? I'm like, yeah, they go to the bar. They know that my drink is for free and they'll go ahead and try and order themselves a drink for free. They'll say, Hey, uh, you know, Mikey wants a pink lemonade and tequila. <laughs> like, and the bartenders will be like, Mikey hasn't ever drank that in five years. Mikey drinks vodka soda and it's not even vodka. It's Tito soda. Like, and that's where like, you know, they've gotten in trouble and you know, that friend is no longer allowed to be out with me. You know, I've had people try and take advantage of that. And for me, not only does that make me look bad, but that makes me look at you different as a friend. Like I'd rather you ask me, I'll get you the drink. than you try and go behind my back and try and be a cheap bastard and get yourself a drink. But it goes hand in hand. Like I said, I, a lot of the times, like the hospitality, the owners might not be there. So maybe there's like a manager or kind of like face of the venue that knows everybody that's shaking hands, that's giving free shots out, that's helping people cut the line or get a table. And like, if you're a venue, you need that person. You need the person that anybody online knows, oh, that's so-and-so. He's the person you need to know in order to be able to party at this place. Right. Right. And like, if you don't have that, if you're a busy place, I feel like you're, you're kind of like missing out or, and if you're not busy, that might be the reason why you're not busy because you don't have that face of your franchise, so to speak, you know? Agreed. Agreed. hundred percent. Gary and I had an incredible hospitality experience a couple weeks ago. It was in between gigs. And I was telling Gary, Gary about this pizza place in Hoboken that opened maybe a year ago. And to me, it's like the best pizza in New Jersey. It's incredible. Uh And it's 10th Street Pizza and Pasta. It's uh, the same owner as 10th and Willow in Hoboken. And we went up there. Love that place. It was packed, right? And the manager there used to be a bartender at 10th and Willow. He used to work with me somewhere else. I didn't even remember him because I'm an asshole. But he literally was (laughs) like, oh, Kareem, Gary, you guys are waiting for a table? I got you. Literally goes across the street, grabs a table, carries it from 10th and Willow, puts it down, grabs two seats, and makes us a table like in the middle of nowhere. They on a busy a, ass Saturday night, they brought like, a heater over and everything. Yeah, like, it was, yeah. Works. dude, it, it's, it's crazy how that works. Cause I had a similar experience a couple months ago. I was, I was out to eat with uh, my girlfriend, my brother, his girlfriend and her parents uh, and my parents. And we went to a restaurant in Montclair, De Novo. And yeah, I walk in and we're waiting for a table Place is packed. Like, you know, we're waiting for our table five, 10 minutes on the reservation still. And this dude comes up to me and he goes, yo, Mikey, I know you. He goes, I used to bartend at rain and you used to play at rain. And I was like, Oh my God. Like I, of course I'm an asshole too. I was probably drunk before I, before I even showed up to rain, <laughs> dude, how are you? Blah, blah, blah. We exchanged Instagrams. Next thing I know we had a table like that. Yeah. Boom, done, done, done. But it goes to show that, you know, just not being a dick in general goes to pay off other places. Cause you never know. Hospitality industry is not just clubs. It's restaurants. It's this and that you go to Vegas, right? It's not just, Oh, Hakkasan, I'm going to Hakkasan. I'm going to the club. No, Hakkasan now merged with Tao. So now it's all 
um, you know, Hakkasan, the restaurants, the, the, the beauty in Essex, like all that stuff all plays hand in hand. So you never know people hopping around the hospitality industry where they're going to end up, whether it's a bar, a nightclub. And I feel like it's going to be like that for the rest of my life where I'm going to walk into a spot and I'm going to know somebody there that used to work at a club with me, like you said, or a bar and take care of me no matter what. And it feels good. And that makes you want to come back. And I'll go back to that restaurant a thousand times. Right. And it makes you want to spend money and tip and take care of people and like send a party there to book a 50 person party. Like they're going to make their money back by, by doing very small things to make you the customer feel, feel a little special. And I really feel like the nightlife industry really needs to focus on that right now. They want people to come back. You have to make people feel special. I agree, but you know what? It's, it's been, it's, it's crazy. Like obviously as an artist, you know, I've been to, every fucking major festival sorry if i can't curse on the podcast but i've been to every all right so i've been to every fucking major festival wherever like and it's crazy how much you don't get treated well where you're from like edc new york for some whatever reason i can never get backstage and i needed to be backstage i needed to link up with the artist i needed to get my music out but tell me why when I go to Ultra, my first year at Ultra ever, I was 19 years old. I get on the stage every year, backstage at the worldwide stage, this stage, all because I DJed in New Jersey at Bliss. I opened for Sunnery James and Ryan Marciano. Their manager remembered me, took me backstage. I met the backstage manager. Every single year I go to Ultra, I go backstage. I go to Vegas. I walk through every single club with what, some of my buddies that are playing. Dre's nightclub. I walked straight in, had a bottle, whatever. Would that ever happen in New Jersey? Never, because you never get taken care of in your own state. And even today, like today, I have to walk in with a DJ. I have a better chance of getting behind the booth or whatever, walking in with the headlining DJ than I do if the promoter walked me by because it's an ego thing. They're like, oh, I'm not going to walk him back here. He's just a New Jersey DJ. But then here I am walking around with like one of the biggest artists in the world, laid back Luke, Mac J, whoever. And I look at the promoter and I give them a little smile. Like, why didn't you take care of me? Like I was going to go back here anyway, you know, and it's happened. It happens all the time. And I always remember that EDC thing. Like it, it made me so mad. I remember. And I always said like, I'm going to become so big. Like it fueled my fire. Like I'm going to become so big that I'm going to be the artist that's going to be back there. And I'm going to wave at you when you're grabbing my bottles and you're bringing them to me. You know what I'm saying? So it's just a weird thing. I don't know what it is. New Jersey egos. <laughs> How do you juggle the two between, you know, going and playing some of these really big shows or working with a laid back Luke or some people that are just far beyond the local scene to then coming back and kind of having to eat a little bit of shit. Like yeah, how, it's, how, how it's you- tough. It's tough and there's no real way to do it. But all I could say is every time I've ever been told no, or you can't do this, I, I always let it fuel my fire. And if that meant, you know, uh, going to the studio, and working harder, or, you know, I didn't get backstage at EDC, so I'm going to make a song that's going to be played at every EDC possible, right? Like that is kind of what always I've done. And it's always worked for me. Like one EDC, I remember um, it was an EDC 2013 or 14. And I had in my phone, all of the email addresses that I got at Ultra that, that two months, three months before that. So I had, you know, uh, Tommy Sunshine, Laid Back Luke. I had all these email addresses, Rehab, Chucky, Bingo Players. I'm like, great. I'm going to work my ass off in the studio. I'm going to send them all my demos. And I got to EDC and I was jumping around in the crowd or whatever. And I lost my phone and I didn't back it up. And all those emails were gone. And that to me was like the biggest thing. Like I was like, shit, man, I was so down on myself. I was so down that I didn't even go to EDC the next day. All my friends were like, come on, come on, come on. I was like, no, I can't. And what did I do? I sat right in this chair. I made one of the best records of my life. And that record ended up opening so many doors for me. And I think we talked about this. Um, That was the record I was actually producing for Paris Hilton that came out called Come Alive. And for me, that was like a game changer because that record opened so many doors in the hip hop world for me, in the music industry world, because it was on YMCMB Republic Records. And I was a 19 year old kid with all the success just like, you know, that came out of me being frustrated with what was happening in New Jersey. Like, of course it happened to me here, but I mean, I, my biggest advice is take every no, every uh, rejection, every, whatever you can and use it as fuel to your fire and just make yourself hungrier. And I, for some reason with all my students, I don't really see that as much today as I felt like it was 
five, 10 years ago, but make that fuel to your fire. That's the biggest form of like uh, motivation. And, and, and that's where like your biggest blossom will come out as a producer or an artist or whatever, whether you're making a mashup or you're making a song, like your biggest accomplishments come from your lowest lows, whether you know it or not. So I think that's like probably my number one thing that's helped me, you know, throughout all this stuff. But um, yeah. Do you think the younger generation just isn't being told no enough? Do you think like oh, hundred percent. Everybody gets a trophy we, now, man. Like right. you, you kidding we've me? Become too much of a yes culture, and it's just like you're just too accessible on social, and like you you get these glimpses of quote unquote success by having lots of followers or lots of views, et cetera, so on and so forth. And like I it makes it puts you it puts your mind kind of on a pedestal when when you're not actually there yet. Like is yeah, there a false I think, sense of I think, success? I think with, with the DJ culture, I think clout is such a big thing. Like for me, when I came up as a DJ, I used to always believe in the secret. And I, something I talk about to my students a lot, and it's basically a documentary on Netflix where if you put something out in the universe, you'll get it. Right. So when I was in college, I, I was never thinking about becoming a big DJ in New Jersey. And if you want to become a big, big DJ in New Jersey, disclaimer, that's fine. If that's your end goal, like go ahead. But for me, I know 98% of the people want to play other States. They want to play around the world. They want to play the big stages. So for me, I had a picture of Swedish house mafia from Coachella above my bed, above my college bed. And I remember going to sleep every night and looking at that picture of Seb Axwell and Steve, just looking out at that crowd with their hands up. And I'm like, dude, I need this like every single day. And by this time I was a senior in college, I ended up winning that DJ contest for electric adventure. I won the opening set. I played, there was maybe about a hundred people. Danny Avila was late to his set. Next thing I know, I go to cover his set. I walk outside into the stadium. There's 5,000 people all around the stadium. And I'm like, this is it. I'm the Swedish house mafia. This is my moment. You know what I'm saying? Like ask, believe, receive, like you're going to get it. And I feel like in today's world, you know, we're so used to typing on the computer, write down your goals, you know, write on a piece of paper, put it in a drawer, forget about it. Don't write it in your computer. Don't take notes on your computer, write that stuff down because I'm a big believer that if you write it down, it's going to come to you no matter what, just like that goal. I mean, I have a little whiteboard right here in my studio and I used to write down, um, get a record on revealed, get a record on mix mash. When I moved out to my apartment in 2019, I think it was, um, I went to go take down that whiteboard and all my stuff. And I looked and I said, Oh, holy shit. Like get a record unrevealed. I just signed the contract for beast today. And I was like, that's because I wrote it down and, and, and I worked towards that, you know? And like you said, Gary, the yes culture, like, I don't know if I, I, I don't know if I could be politically correct on this, but like, I don't believe in that. I feel like the no's make you motivated and, and that's what's going to get you to the next level. I don't know how many times I've been told no, or you're not good enough, or this song's not good enough. That literally fueled my fire to get to where I am today. So yes, I think that clout, social media, big thing that needs to like end, like drop your ego, work hard, keep your head down, stay in your lane and everything will come to you. Um, you said you talked about your students a couple of times. I don't think you fully went into, you know, what uh, what you're teaching, what your what your course is all, what your academy is all about. You want to kind of dig into that a little? Yeah. So pandemic hit. Um, I think all of us kind of when we start to DJ full time, we always thought that let's say I get drunk at a venue or let's say a venue, you know, closes, whatever. There's always another venue you could use to replace it. Right. But I never thought of like, if everything shut down like this, what was I going to do? Right. I didn't think there'd be a time and point where all the venues shut down. So we got to a point. I remember I was DJing uh, the 13th, 2020, March 13th, 2020. And I was doing a sweet 16. I was supposed to play a nightclub gig after that. And I'm finishing up the sweet 16. I go to the nightclub gig and they're like, dude, we have to cancel you. Like, you know, they're shutting us down. I didn't know what the hell was going on. We didn't, we didn't expect that was going to be our last weekend there. And next thing I know, I couldn't work again for a year. So one thing that I was always passionate about has been teaching. And I've always done teaching production side uh, privately. So I, my first student, his name is Mark. He's really, really nice kid. Uh, he actually saw me play in Miami uh, when I played his project graduation. Um, the show was with uh, Bonnie and Clyde, T.I., Rich Homie Kwan. And, you know, he approached me and said, I want to learn how to be like you, you know, and I thought that was so cool. And I said, you know, 
contact me through Instagram. We'll start lessons. So meanwhile, you know, I taught him lessons once a week, twice a week, three times a week. And we kept going and going and going until he was able to like spread his own wings and fly. And now Mark is great. He's verified on Instagram. He's like killing it in like his scene and he does awesome. So I took this as an opportunity to start the Perari Production Academy. And basically in April, I just opened up the academy to a whole bunch of students now because I had time. I had, uh, you know, a lot of guys that always have been wanting to learn how to produce that, you know, didn't have the time to, and now they have the time. And I pretty much had nothing else going on besides this. So I said, let me turn this into a business. I've always wanted to do this. I have the time to do it now. Let me do it. And uh, it's been great. It's been about a year now. We have about 15 to 20 full-time students. Um, obviously, a lot of the lessons are online. I'm going to start to do in-person lessons the more uh, people get vaccinated. And it's been, honestly, it's been such a blessing. I'm so happy that it turned out the way it is. And basically, I go over everything from production side all the way up to the branding side. Um, stuff that took me 10 years of trial and error to learn, I teach you in a matter of months, even weeks. Uh, I think now, I think four or five of the students already have their first or more record signings ever. So that means they have two or three record signings and there's more coming. I just had another student sign a record contract the other day and the, the price that, or the, the look on their face that like they get when I tell them like, Hey, your record's been accepted on this label is just like so priceless to me. Like, I love it. It's like, it's, it, it means the world to me. And, and here we are, I'm back to work and I'm still doing the lessons and, I, and I'm busier than ever. I mean, like yeah. I said, I don't even got time to eat. So I was going to say like, we, we're going to plug the Academy. I don't even know if you could take any more students. <laughs> I can't, I can't, I really can't. And, and, and what's, what's, uh, what's unique about this Academy is, you know, a lot of guys sell master classes online. They do this, they record a course or whatever, but my academy is different because I take my time out of my day and it's a one-on-one -on -one session and it doesn't cater to like, okay, let's program a kick or let's throw in a clap and let's do this. It takes your skill level into account. I look at you and say, this is what you need to work on. And we work from there. So if you have a intermediate uh, foundation or a beginner foundation or an advanced foundation, I have students in all three categories. I cater to you that way. Um, and I think that's been a, a, a big thing on why people come to me rather than buy one of these $300 masterclasses because they get live one-on-one -on -one time with me. And it's been, it's been great. Like everybody has access to YouTube. Everybody has access to a master class. But like when you get one on one, like real person to person uh, lessons in anything, it's pri it's absolutely priceless. Like, yeah. it, it, you know, because you can advance so much more uh, quickly and efficiently by working with somebody who is going to cater to your skill set, like you're saying. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's always worth it. And I think a big part of it also is um, like the branding part of it too, because a lot of guys think it's just making music and that's it. But branding is such a big thing today um, where like you have to do something other than make good music in order to stand out. So something that I talk about for myself is the way my Instagram is branded is I'm always showing off a rare pair of kicks or I'm wearing this cool outfit. So for example, somebody that doesn't maybe know me as a DJ, but is isn't the sneakers may find my page from sneakers and they might become a fan of my music just because they like my sneakers or something like that. And that's just me. But like, what makes you, you, are you into Gary, you have a Mickey mouse behind you. Are you into Disney? Like, are you into this? Are you into that? Incorporate that into your, into your brand and make it you. And that's something that I think um, a lot of the guys underestimate and are learning now with the Academy. I mean, it's, it's even as simple as a logo. You know, how many guys do we know that DJ four or five nights a week, but their logo is made by like a two-year-old or like a, 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 you know, a default random font, like, invest in yourself, pay for a logo, get somebody to design you a logo. This way, when you do show up on a flyer, you have some unique branding that only you have. I mean, even this year, this year, I even paid for my own logo uh, to get redone because I felt like my brushstroke logo as Parari wasn't my identity anymore. And, you know, times change. You got to get up with the times. And it's something that I think a lot of guys overlook that should be, should be uh, shined a little bit more light on. Yeah, I think the coaching aspect it's it's funny because all three of us have that teaching coaching background in some way right yeah 
Like Gary was, a, Gary was a teacher. I used to coach basketball. Both my parents were teachers. And it's funny how like when everything went to shit, we turned to our roots of like coaching and teaching to kind of honestly, like it gave me something to do and, and something that drove me every day to wake up and, and focus on. And it's something that we're passionate about. And it's something that we have a depth of knowledge that we can help a lot of younger guys and girls to maybe take the next step or get to where they want to go and reach some goals that maybe they never thought they could reach. So when, when you talk about, um, you know, records getting signed by some of your students, when, when some of our guys accomplish some of their goals, it's like the same feeling. I'm like a proud yeah. papa. It's such a great feeling. And it's dope. It's, cool. it's, it's, it's so fucking cool. And, and like, I, I don't know, what would you guys do if like you didn't have another hobby like in this pandemic like what the oh, I, I think every day what would i do like be, if i couldn't produce would i play xbox every day would i go get a job like what the hell would i do you know <laughs> this is my life and the fact that this pandemic stopped my life both working and hobby wise was like crazy so i had to do something and and like i said it, it just feels so good when you're helping the next guy it could be the next tiesto i don't know you know I don't know if I'll be able to inspire the next Tiesto or the next, you know, biggest hip hop artist, but to know that I had a part in, in, in their role and their success, uh, it just, it's such a good feeling. And, and I get more joy out of it, more seeing these guys succeed than, you know, seeing a couple of extra dollars in my bank account, to be honest. So. That's awesome, man. So let, let me ask you this. If, if people are listening right now and they want to work with you, are you, do you have like a, like a wait list? Are you, are you taking anyone else? What's Honestly? Yeah. I mean, it, it's depending, like, uh, I'm actually changing the schedule around again this week, but, um, I would say definitely just inquire, uh, info at Perari Um, that's the best place to reach me. If we could get you in great. But like I said, it, it, it is pretty full right now. And going forward, my future plans are, yes, we are going to make a masterclass and we're going to record something like that. But as far as my time, again, we talked about this just before. I'm not Superman. I can't be here 24, seven, 365. Yeah. Um, but you know, I am having an intern come in um, just like, you know, you guys had in the past. I'm going to have my cousin come in. He's going to school to be uh, like a, like an audio engineer, I think, or something like that. So he wants to learn the business. And I think uh, May 17th, I think is the date. So I'll have somebody else helping, just learning, helping around with the daily tasks. And hopefully that will relieve me to do some other things, which will be great. So a lot of it's, cool things happening. It's funny. It's I'm interested to hear what you think of having an intern too, because it's like the same thing, because it's not someone that's paying you for your services or for your knowledge. It's someone who's like going to help you and learn from you for free. But yeah. in turn, you know, they're getting all that knowledge anyway. So it's interesting. And like, the guys that we work with, like, I don't know, we, we want them to succeed more than I want myself to succeed almost. Right. <laughs> yeah. it's I didn't even realize this, but he's, he's a senior in high school. And I know when I was in high school, like my last two months of high school, I still had to go to school every day. I was just like goofing off or whatever, like, you know, like watching movies in the library and stuff like that. But, you know, it's cool that like this, the high schools now, even my little brother did it. It allows them to go out. They don't have to come to school, but they have to go intern somewhere. So you could be an intern literally anywhere that you have an interest in and you work for free and you get the experience. And I think that's so invaluable, you know, and, and I'm, actually like honored, like my cousin picked me, but you know, I think the biggest getaway that he or takeaway that he's going to get from this is, is that, you know, you don't have to make money just from DJing. DJing is just one way in the music business to make money. There's so much money to be made elsewhere, whether it's artist coaching, sample packs, making sample pack, or I'm sorry, making edits for, for some of these music pools. There's so much money to be made. And we have from Monday through Friday, really to work on whatever you want to do to make money, you know, and whether it's, I mean, I make logos for other DJs. I make flyers for other DJs, stuff that I do for myself turned into a business where I make other, you know, I make money doing for things for other people that they can't do. And I think that's the biggest takeaway that he's going to learn from, you know, this internship is what to do as a DJ from Monday through Friday. You know, it's not just downloading music. It's literally uh, everything else that you could do to make money as well with music. And I think that's going to be dope. I love listening to you talk about this stuff because again, like when we have guests on that are successful, just hearing you talk, people are going to know that you're successful because you have all these different things happening. And 
you know, when, when we got shut down, you, you had five other lanes and things that you were working on to try and make some income and just like stay busy and maybe learn something new and start a graphic business or, you know, Always whatever pivot. it is. Always I, pivot, I love Gary. That you so know, much, man. you guys know with basketball, always pivot. You know, there's always <laughs> another way you can go. Somebody's blocking you. There's always another way you can get around the guy, right? So it's so important, man. And I have a student now. He's learning C. I, again, I have nothing to do with this, but he's learning CGI. And he just showed me this music video he made for one of his songs that I helped him work on. And he's like having fire come at him out of trees and he has this sword. I'm like, dude, you got to teach me this. Like, this is fucking awesome. But like, again, it just goes to show he's another guy that like just picked up a cool hobby. And, you know, who knows? That could be a business itself. He could be editing music videos for some artists in the next five years. But really cool stuff. Yeah, man, I, I, I think we're, we're getting close to the end here, but I'm going to I'm going to finish with saying that, like, if you're listening to this, surround yourself with people like Parari, with people that have all this shit going on and are not OK with just like rolling over and like want to learn. And, and those are the people that you want to hang out with because they're going to teach you new shit and they're going to push you to be the best at whatever you're you're working on, whether it's your industry or not. So that's my uh, my, my final two cents. I appreciate that, Kareem. Like I said, it's just, it's a constant grind. Music is 24 seven, 365. Like it's, it never stops. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're not working hard, especially in your, your own lane, the next guy is working harder than you to take your spot. So you have to be on top of your game. You got to be on your toes at all times. And you can't just keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Cause that's just called insanity. So try and learn a new skill. I like, this was the perfect time. If you didn't learn a new skill or start producing or start making mashups during this pandemic, you're already two steps behind. So get on it now before this thing comes back to full normal life. Um, and you know, we got to go back because the next guy that's hungrier than you is going to come up and he's going to, you know, take your place. So, um, yeah, I mean, thanks again. Thanks for having me guys. I love chatting with you guys. Um, yeah, man. we'll see anything, you anything else, anything else you want to plug. <laughs> yeah, no, just check out the prior production Academy. I think, I think if you were looking to produce or just even work on your branding or anything like that, um, you know, hit me up. The Instagram is just at Parari Production Academy. You can hit me up on my Instagram at Parari DJ and shoot me a DM or something and let's see what we could uh, work we, on. We didn't even talk about your music this episode. So go check out Parari on Spotify. Check out his music if you're not, if, if you don't. That's all right. Don't, there's always music no, no, coming. <laughs> there's, nah, music there, coming. there's always new music coming. Um, and also we did a, a, a YouTube video a while back too, right? So you can yeah, check out yeah. Parari's YouTube video. It was an artist spotlight we did maybe like two years ago. So that'll it was be on right. Yeah. It was channel. right before this whole pandemic thing. And we yep. talked, we talked a lot more on your, the production, your production side and your, and your brand and stuff. So, you know, I little, mean, it's better. It's better stuff, to hear the other side of me too. Like, yeah, I'm a, I always keep it real. I keep it a hundred. Like I'm never going to, you know, tell you like a false promise or a false truth. I'm going to be real with you hundred percent of the time. And I think this is like a great episode to talk about that stuff where like you need to do another skill besides DJing, you know, you need to go out there and, and go after what you want to get, because if you don't go do it, you know, it's not going to come to you. And if you take anything from this, watch the secret on Netflix, please. We'll, we'll link to that. Definitely. We'll I feel like talking to my students, but like for homework, watch the secret. I guarantee it's going to like change your mind and t perspective about all this stuff. I'm going to watch it tonight. Cause I've never you should. seen it. So I don't know what it is. Have a beer, watch it. And practice it that's all i gotta say fair <laughs> yeah what do you got you got any closing words no i mean i'm just now i'm motivated to go do something so let's, <laughs> let's finish this hey, look, up it's and, uh... nine o'clock and guess what i'm doing i'm gonna go <laughs> to the gym i'm gonna go pump some weights i'm gonna go better myself because i got a goal to reach 165 pounds by the summer so i can look big and brolic i'm going to miami fourth of july i'm ready to go i'm ready <laughs> You're not only going to see the new me, you're going to see the new summer bod me. Let's go. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> All right, Parari, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, this episode of The Get Pleasure. Down. My name is Kareem. Gary Debbie. Now, Parari. Thanks, right. guys. Later. Peace, guys.